What's up, everyone? Welcome to the EDM podcast. My name is Aiden Russell, also known as Artsy, and I'll be your host. Now, if you're new to the EDM podcast, this is a show where we interview basically any artist, producer, or industry expert in the realm of electronic music production. We've had plenty of people on. As you can see, we're up to episode 161. That is huge. Now, today we have a very special guest because this is the first time we've had someone who I actually know personally and is one of my good friends, Andre, also known as Copycat. Now, Andre is actually one of my groomsmen at my wedding uh, a couple of years ago. So it's really cool um, to kind of have him and chat on this podcast. And because I know him so personally, there's a few cool things we can dive into specifically around his career and how he's experienced a lot of burnout as an artist, how he's dealt with the negative side of social media, and also a whole other host of things like his sound design process. We dive into post-processing. We talk about how he's made some of his favorite sounds on his latest EP, Trash, which came out earlier this year. So this episode is jam-packed full of both career and production advice. So you'll get a lot out of it. I can't wait to dive in. But before we just jump in, I do want to let you know about EDM Foundations. Now, if you're not familiar with what EDM Foundations is, it's our course for new producers where you master the fundamentals of electronic music production in just four weeks or at your own pace. What we really do with EDM Foundations is try and teach you the practical skills involved with electronic music production without just teaching you a bunch of theory or concepts. You're actually going to be finishing professional grade tracks yourself and learning every step along the way. So if this sounds interesting to you and you're a beginner producer, head to edmfoundations.com where you can find out more. But without further ado, let's get into the EDM podcast 161 with Copycat. Welcome everyone to the EDM podcast. Today I am joined by Andre, also known as Copycat. How's it going, man? What's up? I'm good. I'm chilling. That's good. <laughs> good, man. Good. Now, some of you may know from the intro, I kind of alluded to like Andre and I have been longtime friends. So this is kind of a bit of a cheat for me, to be honest. A lot of the questions have uh, are things I already know answers to. But um, yeah, I think this is going to be fun, man. Yes, we can rehash a lot of our deep conversations we've had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think you're the, yeah, like, you're the first guest I've had so far that I actually know in person. Um, pretty much everyone else has been like someone I've never really met before, but yeah, real. um, yeah, man, I mean, for the benefit of the people out there who haven't had the pleasure of speaking to you before, do you want to like dive into like your background as an artist, how you got into music and that sort of thing? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, well, copycat has been my alias for five years. That's primarily electronic, obviously, which I yeah. gather most of the artists you interview are electronic musicians, yeah. but, um, yeah, so Copycat's been my project for five years. I had a, another smaller, well, same amount of focus, but another smaller project before that. Um, but yeah, mostly that's that's been my thing for the last 10 years has been making electronic music among a couple of other smaller digital mediums. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I guess I started that when I was, I would have been 15, yeah, when I started yeah. making electronic music. Uh, and that was because I was into filmmaking at the time, like just like, I don't know, making random stuff with like Adobe After Effects or whatever. Uh, and I was yeah, like, I need a classic. theme song. So I downloaded some piece of software and uh, I don't know, somehow got carried away with that, went down that rabbit hole. And uh, mm. then Skrillex happened to me at some point. So I think that was an influence. <laughs> <laughs> I think Skrillex yeah. happened to everyone who was like 15 around, I don't know, like late, late noughties, early tens. Yeah. Like that, that era, like 2011. <laughs> yeah. 2011 yeah. was a, was a big time. 2010, 2011. I feel like so much stuff. And maybe it was just cause I was, that, that was like a very impressionable time for me, but I feel like anyone else sure. who has memories from that time sort of concurs with me in saying that like that er, that point in music was like kind of very pivotal and lots of stuff happened yes but yes i feel like i'm a product of that uh of that <laughs> phase <laughs> had a big yeah, impact totally. on me <laughs> that's awesome man so yeah, yeah then um you so were you always kind of making the heavier bass music stuff that you're making now like or what what kind of did you start out making when you found and discovered making music 
Um, well, I think originally like Wolfgang Gartner, like a lot of like mm. Electro House kind of stuff was a big influence for me, like super glitchy, super brick wall, like like this like yeah that kind yeah of stuff. I'm, complexro I'm wasn't that the term that was around yeah. at the time yeah, yeah. complexro although back then like in my head genres are very simple it was like if it was 128 bpm and had like a heavy snare it was like electro house or if it was yeah like, 140 it was dubstep or like it was yeah. like all about the bpm the uh, genre but yeah, yeah. It was mostly that kind of stuff like i was emulating like wolfgang gartner and skrillex and probably totally. dead mouse because they just sort of seem to go hand in hand skrillex and dead mouse so like the two electronic artists that everyone yeah. knew when i was in school i think because uh, he saw si- he signed um uh dead mouse signed skrillex to his label early days trap. Yeah, yeah that's right yeah that old that old story of he showed up prepared with his usbs so that was like an anecdote. yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um so I think I mean that was obviously the initial kind of genres, uh, and then Koan Sound when they sort of because I, I would have heard them around 2011, 2012 as well, but I think that took a massive sort of center stage uh, mm. element of my focus uh, once I started hearing Koan Sound because it was just way more sort of heavy and funk influenced and mid tempo. Yeah, um, I have this theory that uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Two, like the soundtrack from that, has had influence on my uh, on my like way that I write riffs because I played just the oh. demo version of that a lot when I was a kid, and that had like Rage Against the Machine uh, and wow. a bunch of other artists that I feel really uncool not knowing the names of, but I would know the, <laughs> the tracks if I heard them. I'm like that's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. It was written yeah, by Tony yeah. Hawk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But, so that mid-tempo stuff, I think, just like took over for me once I heard like Cohen sound and uh, also like Jay Dilla and Mad Lib, like that sort of yeah. like instrumental hip hop um, stuff. Uh, once I started getting into that, everything became very mid-tempo. So I took a lot of the mm. like bass and like heavy drum production stuff into trying to make, uh, I guess, like, yeah, more mid-tempo music. Um, and then from there, it was kind of, it's been a really kind of weird sporadic uh chop and change journey from there of different genres like sorrow was a big influence for me yeah um and just like that really ethereal kind of sound um for sure and some jazz stuff and so it's yeah it's been it's been really kind of uh airy fairy after that but those were the big concrete phases for me i think like skrillex wolfgang gartner and then like cohen sound uh and then neuro hop days like all the art yeah because that was like glitch hop was kind of coming in sort of around once once dubstep had been kind of big for a year or two right like i think the cohen sound like what's his name tipper was he yeah like a, yeah like kind of those those guys started to get a little bit more traction kind of off the tails i feel like of that that dubstep phase that was kind of going around that time right yeah 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 i definitely think like that how big dubstep became ushered in a whole bunch of new people to electronic music like i would Mm. be one of them i would be one of the people that yeah like and and like there's probably a whole crew of people that despise people like me like people who are into like original like uk dubstep which i think is sick yeah yeah. people who are into electronic music before that wave happened that are just like all of these phony kids like into it but (laughs) Totally. That was me. I was that wave of like kids that came in with Skrillex and you know like sort of that huge wave and then yeah filtered into my own my own lane from there. Totally, it, it's so funny. Like a lot of people like have come in through that kind of more, I guess yeah explosion in that era. But like even like me now, like I feel like I've I have a greater appreciation for the stuff that came before that because of of that era. You know, like the more yeah. original stuff, like I, I appreciate more now. It's like, even though people are like, oh, it's so different from what it was. It's like, actually, like no one would know half this stuff nowadays if it wasn't for that, really. So, yeah, yeah, very yeah exactly. I think I think it's done. It's been beneficial overall. Like it's once you get sick of the genre that intro, well, not sick of it, but once like you want to branch out from the genre that introduced you to it, you're going to explore all the other things that, you know, yeah. have a deeper history um and so yeah i'm the same like i I, when i first heard sort of like the uk stuff like scream and banger and that i wasn't super into it because it wasn't thrashy enough for me but yeah later down the track having sort of branched out from where i started um yeah it's all really interesting stuff so i feel like it's Mm. you know i don't think it's ever a bad thing to have a big a huge trend lead people into a a scene like yeah maybe it offends some of the old heads but overall it's i think it's good net positive for sure Yeah, 100%. That's awesome, man. 
Yeah, and then so was did you do any of like the neuro hop glitch hop stuff under your old alias, or was that like purely something you dedicated once you started Copycat? Um, no, I would definitely say like most of the things that I make now, like I definitely feel like I've uh, learned a lot since I started Copycat, but I would mm. honestly say it, it almost feels like quite clean cut uh, how long I spent sort of felt like I was cutting my teeth with this first project. Yeah. Um, and then by the time I started Copycat, I felt like I just kind of knew a bit what I was doing. And it was nice because my old project had like kind of crappy branding and stuff. And there were sort of a lot of janky things about it. Um, mm. I used to go by Alberto, A-B-E-R-T-O, well, which <laughs> even the na- way I got that name was Unco. Like it was like a misspelling and um, yeah, it yeah. Was like a, not a memorable name. Like it was hard and um, I n- had no visuals. Like it was just like for a while it was like a, a like um, iMovie or like a photo booth filtered like high contrast photo of me wearing my headphones. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just, like just imagine like any edgy selfie from 2010 in photo booth and that's what it looked like. It was that. <laughs> so Just go to the Apple store, like take a photo on the MacBook and then just like, <laughs> this is my new profile picture now. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost looks like if I saw it now, I reckon it would look like a meme, like a fried <laughs> meme. Like it, it was that ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, oh, but awesome. i think it was healthy for those things like that's my first project was just a whole bunch of janky shit while i was learning um how to make stuff sound good and figure out i don't know just like just like iron out not iron out all the kinks i never achieved perfection but just like yeah i just learned a bunch and made a bunch of bad tunes and some great tunes and and then yeah by the time i ended that project and made copycat it was kind of like i just figured out a lot of the sounds i liked to make and started using those conventions so it wasn't necessarily yeah. like I changed sounds. I just literally rewrapped the same stuff at, at, a, at a convenient point in my journey. Yep, yep. I think that's a really valuable piece of information and it's something I've noticed a lot of other people have done who've come on the podcast recently is they've all had projects that come before the current one that kind of helped them make like become big, you know, and yeah. that actually had some sort of success. Um yeah, like I, I had multiple projects before Artsy. And, and even though there's things I regret doing under my current project, which I think happens even to people who who have success under their current project, like there's still a whole host of other things that came even before that. And yeah. I think everyone has like some sort of history of like, you know, the early days where they're just like figuring out what what how this all works. And having a separate project for that is nice because you don't have any strings attached to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't think there's necessarily any right way to go about it, but I mm. definitely feel like I, it, it is nice to have that little point of separation where I look mm. at my old tracks and I'm like, it kind of feels like I've got this l- nice little wrapper around my mm. learning curve. There was actually an EP I wrote called the Learning Curve EP. And oh, there's wow. Some, there's some yeah. neat tunes in there, actually. It's definitely yeah. sounds like, you know, new production, but um yeah, it's nice to have that little old container of like that was me while I was learning. But I think mm. there's plenty of people out there who just stick with the same project the whole way through and they go from making crap tunes to eventually making really good ones. Yeah. And I think the separation is probably the listener base where it's like the older tunes that they made that they're not happy with don't really matter because no one goes back that far to listen to them. They've only no. heard the new stuff that's really good. So it's... but. Yeah, mm. I don't know. that was my journey anyway, was having that point of separation. And I think the rebranding actually kind of helped kick it off a lot more because it had that mystery element of like, I'm the mm. same dude. I literally posted some of the same tunes on both accounts. Um, oh, wow. But on the new account, it got more traction because I think the name was easier to remember. It was new, so no one knew who I was, even though these these people were probably from the same community as, you know, like the other alias that I was um, posting under. but. Mm. I think it just it just gave me a little head start in using stuff that I was already making. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, you're right. Not everyone has to do it. I think a lot of people don't do it knowingly. They're like knowing, okay, I'm going to think about doing a separate project in the future. It's just kind of like, you know, if you're a new producer, just do anything and experiment and see what works. And, you know, if it really doesn't work and you hate it in the end, you can always start a new project because no one cares yeah. the, about you at the beginning. Like it's just, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's it. Like, um, I think it's funny. Sometimes you do stuff like uh, you, you can get caught up in the idea that there is a right way to do things, but oftentimes 
the right what ended up being the right way was the thing that you didn't really calculate and and then in retrospect you look at it and go wow that worked out really well um but it just wasn't intentional like that's mm. like for me like like no one wants to like create a project and think like this isn't my real project like i'm going to delete this later like you want to feel like the stuff that you're working towards is your best stuff and so while exactly. i was working on that first project i was convinced that i was trying to make this project work um, yeah. but then just at some point i rebranded and and that became the right decision but it wasn't like i don't know i i didn't have any plan for that to happen i think it just like that's the way things rolled out for me and and that worked mm. and i think there's lots of things like that where the right process often often just ends up looking like the right process because it's the one that worked for you but there isn't really mm. a right process you just you just go through it and you reflect on what worked and what didn't Mm. I was reading this tweet or something the other day. I can't remember who it was from, but it's like if you reverse engineered someone's success step by step, you still wouldn't get the same result because it's like so many factors going into someone's success. Like it's not yeah. just the, the combination of what you're doing. It's when you did it, what were the environmental factors around that? Like did someone randomly happen to click on your profile and they reposted one of your songs and that like, gave you heaps of attention you know like those factors yeah. like we can't control so yeah it's like just kind of see what works in those early days yeah right i think that's exactly it yeah it's literally there are so many factors like it's it's, it's so much better to just go the natural route of allowing things to blossom however they blossom and just like contri- and, and just like um edifying and feeding that process rather than trying to like yeah, replicate somebody else's process. There's just so many things. And I think this applies to developing a sound as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's good to emulate. Like there's certain things you see and you're like, I really want to do that. But yeah. Yeah, you should never feel like you have to, you don't want to carbon copy anybody's process because you won't achieve it. And you'll also miss out on some of the unique nutrients of your environment and the way that you think or the way that you do things mm. um, that you wouldn't get if you were doing it some, someone else's way. Like there's just, they're, they're, yeah, you're in, everyone is in a unique set of circumstances that have unique benefits. And if yeah. you try to carbon copy someone else's process, then you, you will miss some of that. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's, um, yeah, I think emulating is cool. But I also think, yeah, that there is a lot of benefit to just winging it and, and working with what you've got. T- totally. And I think it's also like, when you're emulating something, the point isn't to do it exactly the same as that person. It's more like the principle or concept that underlies it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like the effect it has on you more so than the exact process of how they did it. Yeah. Like like boosting your snare at 200 hertz every single time because X producer did it is not necessarily like the way forward. It's like maybe just the a whole idea of having snares that sound really chunky in the low end is part of your sound that you want and some other producers do that and that's inspired you to do that but right actually i feel like like blindly copying a process like that can actually have worse results because you're not thinking of the overall result in like what comes out you're just thinking of like i have to do this because i know this person did it and that you know if it's already got like say a lot of low end in a sample or something there's no point in putting more in yeah it's like knowing when to to break those rules and just kind of have more principles rather than specific things you follow yeah yeah it's it's more about focusing on the thing that you're creating and 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 like looking at what you've got and seeing how other things can benefit that rather than trying Mm. to turn what you've got into this other thing that you're inspired by like it's 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 yeah. making all of your inspiration benefit the larger picture of what you're naturally working on i think mm. yes it's fun yeah <laughs> i love that man that's no, awesome um yeah man and i and i guess like one thing i wanted to highlight is yeah once you've been doing copycat for a little while like around i'd say probably 2016 to 2018 it seemed that's when you had a lot of this uh, started to have a lot of the success. Um, you know, you you had your tune Tom's Battery with Frequent, which kind of blew up pretty big in 2017. Um, what was that whole journey and and stuff like like that for you? How how did you experience that? Yeah. You know, it's it's really weird. Um, I've had a few talks with Frequent and like Hudson Lee uh, and a few of the dudes who are kind of 
more connected with that scene because Tom's Battery mm-hmm. and Sweet Soul, like a lot of that stuff has gained traction in the US and particularly places like Colorado and places where there's a real scene for this kind of music. I am really disconnected from a lot of that stuff. Like I honestly, right. the, the amount of conversations where I've had with them about it, where they've mentioned such and such artists played this tune of yours and I'm really weirded out like, oh, what? And, the, and it's actually like, I think a lot of that stuff actually went over my head at the time. I didn't really mm. understand how much traction it was getting. Like it just felt like, oh, my tunes are getting some listens and my mate's tunes are getting listens. And it was just like, it just, it looked like numbers on the browser for me like it didn't affect my life at all I was right. still just going to work and you know doing my normal thing and it's only really in the last like year or two it's I've sort of cottoned on to the fact that like like because I'd have people message me and stuff like there was obviously stuff coming out of it but I just didn't have a gauge I didn't under, like I didn't have a scale I wasn't like going to gigs I wasn't really super in contact with lots of other artists so I didn't have any way mm-hmm. to sort of gauge like is this normal like has SoundCloud just got more populated in the last couple of years or like mm. um, should I just be more proactive on Spotify like I just did, I, I had no scale for what was actually happening and it's only in the last couple of years that I've looked at all that and been like oh actually there was quite a quite a period of like things kicking off for me um, mm. but for me at the time um, cause I guess the first thing yeah, I did a couple of releases with like Night Owl, the Night Owl releases were some mm. of the most listens I'd had at that point. Like I put out wise words. That was like the first yep. Night Owl release. Um, so not a Night Owl, Johnny Pearson. Um, mm. we, I've, I've been friends with Johnny Pearson since like 2013, I think through adapted records that were like, they were like one of the oh, yeah. record labels that were kind of associated with a lot of the old like Neurohop forum kind of scene and the SoundCloud scene for Neurohop stuff. Just like kids mm. trying to emulate like Coen sound and Tipper and that sort of thing. Like that's yeah. where they send their demos. So I was involved with that and I met Johnny Pearson and then through a conversation like years later, we kind of joked about creating this collective um, and Johnny, I think, was really inspired by it. I thought it was a cool idea, but I, I'm a very like airy, fairy, whimsical person that'll be very inspired by something one day and then forget about it the next day. Whereas Johnny, yeah. like, kind of, we had this conversation and he was like, no, nah, I'm going to do this. And so he like made Night Owl Collective. And then mm. yeah, Wise Words was the first release I had on that. And there were probably like 20 other artists or something on that. And that got a, yeah. a bit of traction. Um, yeah, because there's like more of a multi-genre kind of future-inspired sound that kind of it was very multi-genre but yeah it was definitely a a specific kind of overall sound to the the label i guess yeah 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 he definitely kind of curated a his own taste there i mean that was the goal he was like i just want to merge a bunch of things together that are kind of inspiring me at the moment and it was kind of yeah. like jazzy futurish music and then neuro stuff um and sort of everything that falls in that gradient um yeah so yeah, there was that, and I think doing that release kind of gave me a sense of like, oh, there's a bit of a market, or, not, or like there's like an audience for the stuff that I'm making. And I I made uh, it was like it's um, which I was just like kind of emulating oh, yeah. Herzeloid. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> um, he's in Melbourne actually. Yeah, yeah, true. He's not far. Um, yeah, it was very sporadic. Like I feel like I I done releases and just seen like gradual increase in traffic. But yeah. it didn't feel like anything crazy happened. Survive felt like kind of a big release. Uh, with oh yeah, with Maxim, and, yeah, Maxim. yeah, yeah. Um, and but that for me was also kind of it only felt big for me, I guess, partially because of the implications of releasing on Inspected and working with Maxim, because Inspected was like a big uh, inlet mm. for me of like uh, my music taste. Like when I was discovering Cohen Sound, I yeah. was listening to Culprit and uh, yeah, like Technia, like just all the dudes that came through Inspected. Um, Totally. So a lot of my experience and memories from that that kind of growth period, aside from seeing my release, my, my listens go up and maybe having a few artists mention me, like it was all kind of like internal measurements where it was like, oh, I sure. worked with this artist, I released on this label or this person played one of my tracks. But it, it's really hard to see what the effect was like until I've mm. like... Um, until I started to actually look at what was happening in the States and like talk to people who are over there and they're like, yeah, you have a name over here. Whereas in Australia, I don't really like, I've got some people that know me, but it's very different. Mm. Long, long winded, uh, long winded response there. But I feel like ultimately I actually don't really know how to answer what that growth felt like. No, that's having offers kind of pop out of nowhere and not really knowing if what was normal. I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. 
That's interesting because like Tom's battery now, like like obviously it's been on up on Spotify for a while. It's like a half a million, which is pretty cool. Like, is yeah. that something that happened recently? Um, I think twenty eighteen. I, oh, yeah. I don't uh because I feel like we released that in like twenty seventeen. Um, a few bigger artists played it and that gave it a lot of traction. Like Bass Nectar was one. I think he was playing oh, yeah. that in a lot of his sets. Yeah. Um, and I've got an edit of his of it. So I think there was kind of it circulated with some some bigger DJs for a while and that gave it a lot of traction. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming it got in some playlists or something like that. So yeah, I don't know if that was immediate because it yeah. felt like that was just within the upscale community. And it's just like it yeah. just felt like the upscale community really liked that track. Um mm. but then yeah, I it obviously branched out at some point, but yeah, like I said, I've been so disconnected from a lot of that growth that I don't, I couldn't honestly say, yeah, this is when it happened. I was just like, occasionally I've looked at Spotify and then one day someone was like, dude, Tom's Battery's got a lot of listens. And I was like, yeah, it does. That's weird. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Kind of like diving into that disconnect a bit. I mean, like, because I feel like after that, I mean, knowing you personally and also just like seeing what happened with your music music project you kind of went through a bit of a phase where you kind of re were like thinking about like your priorities you kind of mm-hmm. had a if it, i don't know if this is the right term but like a bit of a burnout with music and that kind of thing um because yeah. i feel like this is an important thing to talk about like in in music and in the music industry because a lot of artists probably experience some some similar things to that but don't necessarily acknowledge it yeah. um what what kind of happened around that time after you were getting all that success? Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely did have like a burnout. Um, yeah, it was weird because I think um, you're not, you don't really, there's no way to really prepare for getting attention for yeah. music. And I, I think it affects everyone differently. Like it's very much down to your personality. There sure. are some general traits that it's like, I think everyone experiences some form of like ego inflation or sense of like, uh, performance anxiety when a lot of people start paying attention to you. Um, yeah. For me, I remember it would have been about 2018, I think. Um, I was doing a lot of tutoring and I'd started to get like offers in the States for gigs and that sort of thing. And it just started to feel like music was a bit more serious. Yeah. Um, and I think, I guess when it feels like the best thing in your life is like hinges on a specific thing that you do or a certain skill, it can just create a lot of pressure for you to like perform and Mm. do that specific thing. And I think I just, I I hadn't really had anyone explain to me, um, I guess how to handle that. And, and I think, Mm. um, it's just a very vulnerable thing, I think, because I've always just written music that I thought was really cool. And before I had people really paying attention to my stuff, it, it there was no disconnect between like um, the music that I liked and the music that I made. It was always just like the music that I made was just this perfect, organic, very naive summary of things that I liked. Um, yeah. With the occasion of like, if, if a couple of people listen to one of my tunes a bit more, I'm, I might be like, oh, I'll make that genre again. Like it was yeah. very like sort of naive and honest. Whereas when I started to get traction and feel like, oh, people don't want to hear so much of like, you know, the chill or like melodic stuff. People want to hear more of this banger stuff. And that was only because a couple of the more bangery tunes I'd written had gotten traction. I'd started to get this idea that I need to perform in that aspect. And it's just, I think a lot of that sort of reality had started to, started to affect me and I'd started to think a lot about my image and like getting messages on Instagram and offers via email and stuff. I think it was easy to get glued to my phone and social media. And that is mm. like, in a way I'm grateful for how much it like exacerbated the, the effect of um, that anxiety because it kind of, it was like a more potent uh, vaccination. If I could put it one way, it's like yeah. I had a heavier dose more quickly. And so it yeah. burned me out quicker. Whereas if I'd had a slow burn, I feel like I could be in that 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 crap place for a while but basically yeah i I burned out right i I was really like i was doing live streams and and tutoring a lot and i didn't have a lot of confidence i felt like all of my validation came from what people were saying about me and my only confidence and and drive to write music came from seeing stats and seeing Mm. messages and likes and listens and like it was all kind of this very codependent thing i was really dependent on making people like me and if i didn't get that response if i didn't get like you know chemical stimulation from my phone Mm. then i'd get like anxious it was actually like this weird yeah it it, it can get really chemical so anyway i had that burnout and i think 
for a while, I just, I just really craved the feeling of being normal in the sense that like, I just craved not having music in my life at all. And I missed that feeling of just making stuff yeah. and, and being playful and just having a sure. normal life. Cause it did affect my friendships a little bit as well. Cause it kind of affected how I saw myself and it just gave me this feeling of like the, the best aspects of me are these things that people validate me for on the internet and it, it doesn't yeah. translate to friendships when the friends you've known have known you before you started writing music and then suddenly you're just becoming this music guy and you know like I'm, yeah I'm yeah copycat, and like you know I just got this ego um so I think the process after that I had a few sort of burnouts um, the yep. first one was around 2018 where I just burned myself, I like just burning the candle at both ends, lots of burning. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, I stopped doing tutoring um, and I kind of announced that I wasn't doing music anymore because I felt like mm. the only way to separate myself uh, from music, like it was like I couldn't trust my ability to self-respect. The only way I could like separate myself from music was to officially tell everybody to leave me alone, kind of. Like it, I, couldn't, right. I couldn't just trust myself to like give myself a break when I needed. I didn't, I, I hadn't learned that skill. So I announced it. And then um, I think the thing is after having that break, I started enjoying music again. Um, and there's probably also a bit of that still chemical craving of validation. So I ended up back in same thing. So I had these waves where like for a few years, I'd say 2018, 2019, up to 2020, I had a few waves of like just wanting to get away from music, even though I still really enjoyed writing it. Mm. Um, and it was all just ironing out the kinks of like being codependent on the kind of vi- validation I would get for making music. Um, sure. And uh, I went through that phase. I, 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 you would maybe remember the phase where I had the brick phone. Yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. The, <laughs> I had the Nokia phone. And my my Pixel actually, my Google phone broke. Um, Google isn't sponsoring this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to be just to be clear, everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, my phone broke, and then I just I had this. I just got this Nokia phone because I thought maybe it's actually a good time to just like detox. Yeah. So I just like cut off everything social media related at that point in my life, and it, mm. and at that time it was really good because um, I just I felt like people only had access to me if I went out of my way to give them that access. Yeah. And that was a good feeling to become familiar with, to be able to actually learn that, okay, I have control over um, how and when I broadcast myself um, and I have the power to decide who has access to me, which wasn't many people at the time, yeah. uh, but I, I think I needed that that growth. And then from there, I think through a few waves like that i just gradually started to get this sense of like okay i can do what i want to do i can release when i want to release i can make what i want to make people don't have to hear this but there is a real joy in sharing music with people yeah um but it was a real tug of war for a while yeah. of like it's my thing i'm i am who i want to be and you know i want to be honest with myself but also like it's really lovely having people that genuinely just enjoy your honest output and just like that tug of war was just kind of finding that sweet spot of like learning how to broadcast myself and be vulnerable um, without compromising and catering, uh, which I'm still learning, but I feel like that's that's been the journey. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, you know, you could have like in theory kept going because you're on a very good trajectory in terms of the numbers and in terms of like you know, having a career out of it. But I feel like, you know, even despite all that, it's like, well, what's more important here is like that that success or like actually like my mental health right yeah. now. And I think it seemed like even though from the outside, it might've seemed like, why why is he doing this? It's like, he's got all the success. It's like good to hear from the other perspective. Like these are the realities that artists face, especially mm-hmm. in a world where like social media and that kind of thing is considered important. And like to a degree it is, uh, like to build a career out of it like I think there there is some element of social media that plays a role but it is very difficult like you said to overcome the validation and like it becoming a crutch rather than a tool for like yeah. your self-worth um, I think that's just the reality of social media right for sure yeah and I mean in terms of output like I kind of wish this was the first thing I'd said when you brought this up because this is one of the things that actually made it very apparent that I needed some sort of repair was that it became really hard to write music Right. Um, Like when you're like you're the quality of your output does actually kind of reflect your mental state. Right. Um, And and I I found that in so many aspects, the the kind of music that I was writing, like you can force a process. And I think there is some value into having some mechanical reinforcement to writing because it takes the stress off of like, I don't know, 
having to be some superhero and like feel super up to the task like yeah i think some a lot of writing music is also just having the faith to kind of be like yeah i'll probably write something sick today and then you just sit down and do it yep. and then it does work yeah but i think at the time when i was in that really like yeah overexerting myself kind of phase um it just get, became really hard to write music because you can't feel anymore. Like you can't actually feel, do I like this? Do I not like it? You've kind of neglected that part of yourself in favor of do mm. other people like this? And the only way that like no one's in the room with you. So like the only way that you can know if other people like the stuff that you're working on is to go and look at what they're listening to or like yeah. post something that will draw attention to yourself. Like you're constantly trying to pull people into your process rather mm. than using the the thing that actually creates the music which is your own sense of what you like um mm. so you you i think the only real r- sustainable way to to create and to create good stuff is actually to look after yourself you you can't yeah bring it dry you know it's i honestly think creativity is like growing a plant you know you can't if you pull the fruit off before it's ready it's not going to be as good and sometimes mm. you might have to wait a while and you really just have to the water the plant whether or not there's fruit you know, you just have to w- w- go on that creative journey, whether or not you're pumping out amazing tunes or whether or not mm. it's showing, you know, heaps of listens. You just go on that journey and then at some point the fruit happens and you don't like at, at the point, I think you know the fruit is ready when it's basically falling off the tree. That's what it's like. It's like it's, it's yeah, barely right. clinging on. That's what it's like. It's like hard to hard to keep it in when, it, when it's uncomfortable to keep all the demos in, although that could be misconstrued. But like, I don't know, yeah, yeah. at a point where it's just falling off, it's easy to put stuff out. I think that's a good time. You don't have to force it. Um, right. That's an interesting analogy, the the tree. Like I've heard a similar one, which was it's, it's a little different. It's like creativity is like a tap, like an old tap. It's like when you first turn on the tap, like it's going to be putting out all this really weird stuff. And yeah. Then you just have to wait for it to run clean, which may take a while for it to run clean. Yeah. Because it hasn't been like... You know, if you're starting out, like you've never turned on the tap, you know, so to speak. So, yeah, that's another. Yeah. There's, there's a few interesting analogies. That's a good one. I like that though. Yeah, I, like I think the old yeah. tap analogy is good because it kind of represents the stagnation. Because I definitely had that. Like, it's funny because it's I would describe it as being rusty, which is what you'd get from yeah. an old tap. Like all the water that's been kind of sitting in that gap between the the, the bore or the you know the water table and the yeah. end of the faucet is probably got rust in it and it's all kind of yeah. stagnant and gross and got yeah. it. like it's a bit like that often i find there's if there's demos and stuff i've been sitting on for a while like they're cool demos but my process has changed between then and now and so there's often this like yeah. rusty period where i'm making stuff that's not that exciting but you just keep doing and then eventually you yeah. make something that's brilliant and it sort of feels more representative of the state you're in at the time i don't know yeah yeah that technology that's cool i like that yeah yeah totally I think like really, really, really quick deviation as well. I think on that, like one thing I've been noticing is like, I find if it, if you're like having all these demos that like you've been sitting on for a very long time and you don't work on them for ages and then you kind of evolve as a producer by like working on newer tunes. Like I think it's better sometimes, like there is something to be said for going back and reworking an old tune. You can learn a lot of skills that way, but sometimes it's better just to like write new stuff instead of like trying to make your old stuff work in your new context, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I so agree with that. I think that like I had this idea for a while that everything I create, I have to release. Um, but yeah. I've had this kind of more like holistic relationship with my creativity where everything in my creative process is just kind of happening. And what's interesting now is what I've found is happening is I'll create a demo and oftentimes I won't do anything with it for like a month or two. Um, and then hearing it after that first month of like not doing anything with it, I get like a new surge of creativity um, or it yeah. just becomes crap or it just becomes shit that's laying around. Like it's, yeah. not, it's not actually that big of a deal um, what happens with it. It's just like it's the same as like if I make a snare, like I can't release that snare and I'm not thinking about releasing that snare. So I don't really care what happens with that snare, but there might yeah. come a point, you know, half a year from now where I'm working on a tune and I hear that snare and go, oh, that was, that's great. That's perfect. But so the, I, I feel like not everything has to be like a release from that project that you wrote it in. Like it doesn't have to be like that, that dot ALS. Like mm. it doesn't have to be that. That's just like a piece of thing that you created that might contribute to something bigger. Like, and it might be even a multimedia thing where you've just made this project and it's just sitting there and I don't know, you're working on some visuals and then you think, oh sure. man, the pad from that project would work great. Like you can just kind of have this big toy box of stuff that you've made 
and mm. point where you go to release stuff, it it doesn't have to be that that restricted. You know, you can just pull random stuff out of the toy box. It could be a six year old demo. It could mm. be a thing you made yesterday. But everything is just kind of cycling through the creative process until it comes out as something. So it's mm. totally fine to have like stuff sitting there. And I almost think it's maybe healthy just to have random bits sitting around that you revisit that no one's heard. Um, yeah, I think Dead Mouse calls this concept like his vault like yeah. of, of ideas. Because I mean, I mean, I'm a big fan of like, especially if you're like new at pro- production, I think you need to like learn how to finish a track. I For think sure. like like I I kind of fell into a trap in between there though, where like once I learned that, I felt like I had to finish everything. Well, yeah. and, and and I still think finishing as much as possible without like burning yourself out is a good skill because even if you don't release that or and and finished also like well I will say like it's kind of a it's a fake word. It's a fake. It's a fake because finishing is never really true. Like there's always something more yeah. you could do, especially when you're at that last 10% of a track where you're just polishing things. There's always little things you could always keep changing. But like there yeah. is something to be said for like at least getting things close to finished as much as possible so you learn those skills. But yeah, you don't have to release everything you make. Like I think it comes that mindset comes from like if you're a new producer and you're struggling to finish you're like i finally finished a tune it has to be released now it's like yeah well not not actually like maybe when you're early on it might be a good idea to do that but once you like you become more of a, a mature producer um as a matter of speaking like then yeah you don't have to release everything i i would agree with that now yeah yeah i think this is actually touching on an interesting topic for me i think in the last year i've broken down a lot of sort of like ideas i had about releasing um where i think of it more now is yeah it's not nothing is finished it's actually just about presenting and it's the joy of presenting so a release i've realized is kind of this really ambiguous thing where it's like maybe for a while for me and i think when you're learning the joy of presenting is packaged in something like a SoundCloud release where it's like, I just want to make a track that is this long and has a title and can go on my SoundCloud and feels complete in that aspect. But then the more you start to experiment and create different things, your idea of what a a presented product looks like can change. Um, This is what I found with like, say the the box of demos. Um, Mm. In terms of creating a Spotify release, a lot of those demos are not even close. And so for a while, I had this kind of like anxiety mm. or this frustration where I was like, nothing is close to finish. Like, what? when am I going to get stuff out? But then when I started doing like DJ sets or like I did the upscale, like uh, like my audio visual kind of thing I did a few weeks ago, like a month ago, um, all the demos I had sitting, they were perfect for that because they didn't need to be finished. They just needed to have the elements to assemble a set and they worked really well for that. And I realized Mm. like in this context, they are finished or presentable. It's not really about like that format of presenting is it's so context sensitive. And this is why it's fun just to have a big box of stuff that you've made because when you find the context that you want to present to, then it's like, oh, suddenly all of this stuff has like a purpose and a meaning and a value where it's like, okay, within this context, these things can be finished or are not far from being finished. And it doesn't have to be this like universal, completely polished, complete thing. Um, mm. It's it's always just within the context of presenting. So I think those are the two things that you kind of juggle when you're a creative is like the process of just creating and just letting stuff out and then the joy of presenting and the feeling of like showing up somewhere, mm. being present and allowing yeah. people to see your creative process and figuring out what experience you're creating with that, which is so varied that it's it's like fine just to have stuff laying around because there's always a new thing that you can a new way to present your stuff that's interesting Uh, yeah because i guess like live sets or stuff like that are great especially if you are djing like you know having tools that you can use just for those like that maybe and i think this is another another really good example of this is um porter robinson like when he released his worlds album um i'm not sure if you're like super familiar but he, for his live sets, he had all these live versions of his songs right. that were like really different from, um, quite quite different from the like they were more heavy, they were more like big, like really worked well in a context of like live performance. Yeah, but everyone was wanting him to release them, and he was basically like, "These, I could I could release them," and and you know, I I think if he released them, it would do really well. But 
you yeah. know, as as a listener, but like he was like, nah, like they were made just for the live sets. Like I don't necessarily want to release them. And I think that's a valid approach. You know, like yeah. if you really don't want it, you can just keep them for for your live sets. But it's so true what you say about context. Like you could have the same track and just in two different contexts, like the way it's released or the way it's packaged can feel very different. Like yeah. even artwork, like artwork, title of the song, you know, like those are actually two very key factors in like the context of yeah. the tune, you know? Yeah. Well, I think the context really drives the process in a sense. Like there's, I think there's a natural mm. kind of like generating or mucking around that you do where, well, I feel like that's, that, that is kind of an element for me of like just mucking around and making random stuff. But mm. then what drives things to some sort of completion is the context in which I want to present it. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's nice to kind of be liberated from everything as a Spotify release because right. yeah, some things like you just write differently or you create differently when you have a different context in mind. Like if I was just wanting to make something exclusively for, you know, bumping in my car, there would be a lot of things that I wouldn't worry about and certain things that I would really focus on and that would mm. sort of dictate where the track would go. Um, mm. And it's liberating because some yeah, sometimes you've just got stuff laying around that you don't realize is is actually very close to being finished within the context that you would use it for. But because you're mm. thinking about the wrong context when you're writing, you've just got these like really lofty, faraway goals of like everything has to be this super complete thing. Yeah. Um, but like, I mean, even like writing an album, I've sort of like dabbled in that lately. And yeah, yeah I think the the difference between writing a track as a single and writing a track as a piece of a bigger like story, it's very different. And like, I feel like I actually sure. feel like with an album, it's actually more about the complete experience and sort of the rough ideas fit in really nicely. They don't have to be complete for them to have the vibe of an album. Um, yes. And then once I've got that context, it's much easier to finish the tracks because I can actually see a bigger context. Whereas with a single, you're trying to make this one standalone track everything it can possibly be within a standalone context and it's just like different and it's just like a different creative process and i think whatever you're most motivated to create th that's a good way to angle your process is like what context most inspires you and then that will probably drive you to just like finish the stuff that you're sitting on mm, um, that's uh, such a good point you even see that with like um like with all like the tiktok reels kind of like music producers remixing like memes and stuff like that like they're not making full tunes, fully mixed and mastered tunes for those right. those things. They're making like, you know, a, in a way like a minimum viable song, yeah. just to like showcase the meme or showcase the the I don't know, like whatever it's about. You know, like the funniness of it or or like the coolness of it. Like, oh look, I took this vocal from Alicia Keys playing on Instagram and remixed it. Like for those kind of formats. It like you don't have to go to the length of finishing a full track, but then like obviously yeah. if you wanted to go and like release that or or do a full official bootleg or whatever, then it would be a matter of you know maybe spending a bit more time on the mix down and fleshing it out into a full arrangement. So that's another like different context again. You know, it's really dependent yeah. on on what the context is. Yeah, yeah, and I think in that context there are probably certain things that you would do to make, you know, 30 seconds or 15 seconds of audio be really attention grabbing that mm. you probably wouldn't focus on so much if you were making a 3 minute 4 minute song. Yeah. And like there there are three there are a bunch of 3 minute or 4 minute songs that wouldn't have the same impact in a 15 second window because yeah. they were engineered to be a three minute experience. Whereas yeah, if yeah. you've got a 15 second clip in mind, then you can put a lot of energy into that tiny little snippet and think mm. about that. Um, so yeah, it's not even that that would necessarily be less effort. I feel like in a lot of ways it could be less effort to do a 15 second thing, but yeah, it's just another context that would inspire creative effort funneled into a different kind of window. Mm. Yeah, exactly, man. Mm. That's awesome. One, one thing I want to kind of switch things up with, is talking more specific production now. I feel like now's a good time to dive into some some of the juicy stuff I know sure. you can yeah. unpack. Yeah. yeah sure. Um firstly, I guess like what have you been doing in the studio and in the door lately that, that's been inspiring you? Like any techniques or or things you've been playing around with? Because you're obviously, for those of you who don't know, like really into sound design and really about like the details and creating crazy sounds. Like so I'd be really interested to see what you've been up to 
For sure. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, because I feel like my sound design process is all about getting like the most pristine version of things I've already heard in some ways. Like sure. I'm trying to make the best kick drum and the best snare and the best bass. So I feel yeah. like sometimes the byproduct of that is these weird sounds uh, that I make and I'm like, just happens to be like an interesting artifact of a process. It kind of sounds like something I would make, but it's like, I'm, I'm not intending to make new sounds. I'm trying to make another, like yet another 808 kind of thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, at the moment, it's all been like sub stuff. And like, I'm just finding uh, like making basses work so well if you start with the sub. Uh, and do all of your processing off of that. Um, right. So I'm doing okay. a lot of like just making the most like kind of natural, interesting, like smooth sounding bottom end, uh, like bass hits and 808 kind of stuff. So I use mm. like, um, uh, I'll start with anything, honestly, like filter resonance. Sometimes if you just get something that like triggers you, actually you were at my house the other day and we made that filter resonance bass and it was just oh, like, yeah, the kick and the, the, yeah, we did yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 We just use like a little transient to trigger the filter resonance and then just like process this long ringing sign tone, uh, to make like a, a, a like a beefy sounding bass. I just find like those, that's the best way to end up with something that sounds fat when you listen to it, because it's all kind of harmonically, sound like it, it'll yeah. come from the same origin point all the all the like artifacts so yeah. i'll often like start with some sort of base element and just try and like warm up the bottom end as much as possible in mm. like in like sort of little tweaking ways like i use like m wave folder to kind of like get some interesting shapes and curvature out of it i mm. use uh waves r base it feels like oh, such yeah. a hack because like it's just it's like a one knob plugin you just put it on and it's like some sort of multi-band compression disperser thing for sub but yeah. some things it just makes it sound super beefy um so i right. just like, put that on like a pretty clean bass with a few harmonics yeah and that'll just like add some grit and then i'll go for like um well, what are the things i'm warming up with like i use like little radiator or um, yeah that's a good one and then usually just like different types of filtering just like subtle low passing or high passing with resonance to try and just like peak different frequencies and then once i've got a bass tone that like a subtone that i really like that just feels good then i'm going and adding like ott and and using an eq to like pull up the upper the upper parts of the range like the upper mids and the treble and i just find all of the like source that comes out of the comes out of the bottom end sounds good because the bottom end um, is good yeah, uh, it kind of all glues together really nicely, and then usually I like top it off with like M saturator or something just to kind of like pack it all together. Wow! Um, so like obviously like for someone who's maybe newer to sound design, like one thing I'm just thinking from like you know more of a beginner's mindset, like when someone first thinks about sound design, they think like oh I'm gonna make like a cool patch in Serum, but your process yeah. is extremely oriented around like post processing. I think this is super valuable because when I learned this, it like changed my way of thinking about sound design It's like really a, a lot of what you're doing is effects processing off on the source material. Yeah. Um, was that something you like discovered early on or like what, what kind of led to that your, pro that kind of being your process with these sort of things, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, there definitely was a shift. I think initially I was kind of like the serum guy where I would open my, I would open like I used to use massive and yeah. you try to make, that sound be that sound in the first patch yeah um, and that was mainly because i was emulating other artists and i didn't really know what their process was so i'd just try and like get the settings mm. right on my plugin to make it sound as close as i could like i assumed they were just like using wavetables and it was just like the right wavetable with the right settings to yeah. do it um so yeah i was like emulating skrillex with like massive um mm. Modern but, talking. Yo, yeah, yo. modern talking and just like <laughs> band, band reject, like yo, yo, like that <laughs> yeah. kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I, I did try really hard to make the initial patch sound really good. But what I found, I think once I stopped emulating artists so much, not that I think people should not emulate, like I think it's mm. that's a really good way to cut your teeth because you're trying to make the sounds that you like. Yeah. Once you get a few techniques that sound good and I started to figure out what plugins make cool sounds and sounds that I like, yeah. it became more of an iterative process where it was like I'd start with a sound that I kind of liked and then add an effect that I kind of liked and then I would get ideas from there and sort of like slowly branch out. So I never know yeah. what I'm trying to create, but I just kind of have an idea of what the next effect will do to this sound or how I can like milk more cool sounds out of this thing that I'm mm. working on. Um, so yeah, I think it, it it's a lot more iterative and like taste-based 
now than it is just like I have a sound in mind and then I try and make my plugin make that sound. Like I, I can yeah. get, I can generally get maybe forty percent close um, to stuff that's like in my head with yeah. just the plugin and a couple of effects. Generally, though, it's wow. iterative. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, like, I'm experimenting. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like tweaking and tweaking, and you figure out kind of what things work over a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like it, I, I do definitely like, I think that there's a, another part of my process, which is emulating where I'm kind of like cutting my teeth on other people's sounds and sort of trying to figure out what it is mm. that I like about somebody else's sound and what I'm trying to extract yeah. out of their process. Uh, so like recently I had like a big kind of phase of trying to emulate a lot of like the more current drum and bass stuff like, like yeah punchin sound and like imanu and yeah uh, synergy and like even uh mephius like that kind of like really compressed loud sounding drum and bass yeah um, yeah i think i extracted techniques from trying to emulate that stuff but that's generally it's like it's fun to learn in the sense that like once you get it it's fun but it can be really annoying where you feel like you're just making stuff that sucks it just doesn't yeah. sound as as good as the thing you're trying to emulate and you're trying to do everything with plugins and like it, it's less fun because you're not just like mucking around and letting things go where they go you're really trying to like repeat something so that can be mm. harder i think trying and that's where like i think people who are tr going to try and do everything in serum or whatever i think it's a good process to learn but yeah it might not be as satisfying in some parts because you have to like it, it's kind of the learning part not the experimenting part but i don't know i don't mm. know where the right balance is maybe you can just experiment your way to a great sound that's probably a totally valid thing I think once you experiment with post-processing as well, like you can actually, re you realize, oh, I can actually make something decent inside just Serum. Like, yeah. Because you kind of, all right, okay, the effects in Serum, for example, like that's going to be key to me getting the sound I want, right? Like the filtering, the oscillators and the movement is kind of like, that's like the the core ingredient, but like really the 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 this finality of the sound comes from the effects and the distortion and, like even reverb and extra filtering and that kind of thing. Like, so once you kind of go outside of the the traditional, like just in one plugin, synth plugin, making everything, and you experiment with like distortion and and reverb and multiple stages of processing too, um, then you can kind of realize that there's a lot of power just in anything. Really, it's like a more of a sound design mindset rather than like a specific approach. Right. Yeah, I think when like getting a feel for how your plugins actually or how the effects you're applying actually affect the sound, that's yeah. when you get to start having the fun because it becomes like less of an instructional like set this parameter to 40% and then do this. It's actually like, oh, I have a feeling adding OTT to this will make the, the treble feel like more upfront or it'll make it feel more squashed or however you mm. feel about the plugins you use. Yeah, having a relationship with the effects is what allows you to kind of just create cool sounds because you have a feel for what they're going to do to the sound and that's when you kind of yes. do the iterative thing and just make cool sounds on the fly mm. that's awesome man and i feel yeah. like um one really good rep like representation of like your sound design process is on your like latest ep which is the trash ep mm. um so that came out that came out last year right yeah yeah oh actually no it's technically january this year right at the beginning oh yeah. damn so it was this year cool cool yeah, yeah. This man time is just like gotten away with me i have lockdown. no scale yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because you because you, you've you obviously moved from brisbane to melbourne last year so you've been you've been in a significant portion of the lockdowns now as well so time yeah, is just in the void yeah. with you yeah time disappears yeah. like it feels like I, I moved here in october last year and my yeah. scale from then to now is i don't know where yeah. one year ended another one began i don't know yeah that's so true but um yeah. yeah i feel like that was a good representation of like your capabilities as a producer and sound designer like was that was there anything on that ep you learned or used in terms of sound design um uh, as in like new things that i did on that ep that i'm still doing or you mean like uh, yeah sort of thing yeah that sort of thing yeah yeah, I mean, I definitely think there are some conventions that got repeated, uh, like things that became staples in my sound design process. Like I think uh, Trash, that track, uh, I'd started sort of doing this process of making a bass in FM8 um, and I'd start with like OTT and some form of saturation after mm. FM8 from the get-go. So it's like a sine wave going through OTT and saturation and then yeah. I'd be applying effects to it. 
Um, and that from there, I sort of learned this process with using FM8 because uh, FM8 is quite dry to begin with. And like, I think I find often yeah. to get the top end and the like the upper mid and treble material out of an FM sound. Um, unless you're using post-processing, you have to do a ridiculous, like unreasonable amount of modulation that tends to sound really bad. Yeah. Um, so I found adding OTT and saturation right off the bat, I was just like, I was getting a lot more nice sounds out of less intense modulation. So like uh, using FM8 and then some post-processing uh, and then usually after that, it would be like some filtering or something like that. Um, that process it sounds quite tinny, like when you're using just FM and modular yeah. stuff. I think that's what a lot of people, when they start doing FM synthesis, it's like, if I just tweak these two knobs, it just sounds really weird. But yeah. It's actually like the subtle movements in FM and, and kind of keeping it more weighted towards the low end, I think where a lot of the power comes from it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it kind of sounds like really kind of quacky when you have like a lot of like, uh, like FM modulation, just like straight in, it kind of sounds like this, like, like it's really like, it's, yeah. it's, and it's cause you're just bending this waveform to a ridiculous amount. So you just end up with like, when you look at the waveform, like I'm, I'm kind of someone I really enjoyed looking at the waveform, like it's kind of like, a, yeah. <laughs> it's a slightly arousing thing for me to see a good <laughs> waveform. Like, oh, <laughs> thick. like, and I think when you do a lot of FM modulation, you lose that that core like the fundamental waveform sure. kind of end up like distorting it to the point where there's there's it's, it almost looks like white noise yeah um, totally so, yeah to get the top end content it's better to do post-processing and just have like kind of something simple with a few operators just doing simple things um so that process started with like trash i think or it was around then i'd started mucking around a lot with that uh, awesome and then the ott stuff like i think just my way of using ott of like kind of doing a bit of OTT and then saturation and then some sort of like frequency peaking into distortion and then more OTT sort of like iteratively doing that, that kind of shows up a lot in like dunk and, yeah. uh, and then low ride as well has the same bass that I had in uh, sweet soul. It's like the, I, I don't, it might even be the same patch or I just did the same process twice cause it was pretty easy. Mm. Um, but that's just like a micro sample with a low pass and then a bunch of OTT and saturation afterwards. Um, nice. So there, yeah, there are a couple of things in that EP that I think have just become staple, uh, staple base design for me and, and like cool. drum design and stuff. I think that's awesome, man. Mm. Yeah, no, it's definitely, um, I feel like in some ways, like a seminal body of work, if that's the right term, I don't even know if that's the right term, but it's like definitely like a good reflection of your like capabilities. So, no, it's awesome, man. Mm. Good to know. Interesting. Yeah. Um, cool, man. We'll slowly bring this to a close. I wanted to ask, like, with where you're at now and 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 all the stuff you've gone through with music, are there like things you're planning over the next kind of six to twelve months? Or, um, yeah. Honestly, I mean, I've got a lot of demos and a lot of bits on my computer, and and, and I mean, it looks like that uh, that toy box kind of scenario where like there are some mm. things that are like pretty much finished and there's like be there's bones of an album yeah. um, that I'm quite excited about but that for me awesome. is, is is also just kind of this container I'm funneling creative inspiration to and there's other mediums like not just music kind of going into that um, but cool. for me at the moment I just kind of want to be more present like I kind of would like to do more shows and stuff and just pull stuff out of the toy box and yeah and give it a whirl um so at the moment for me i would like to be sort of looking at doing more shows um circumstances granting obviously but yeah um yeah i think it's just a matter of showing up places now because i'm at i'm at this point where i've got a very full toy box and i've got lots of sounds just sitting there and lots of ideas just sitting there but yeah it's just like finding a context for me and going oh that would be cool like upscale fest was like that so upscale fest yeah. was like a little digital thing for those who didn't see it uh but it was just like a twitch stream and we just like put together our own visuals and then 20 minutes of our own stuff cool. um and that was a cool thing for me to just like get stuff out of the toy box and assemble 20 minutes of content so awesome. just yeah. things like that i think are the goal just to show up and yeah. play some stuff <laughs> that's awesome man no it's good to keep it simple like and just yeah no, that's what you want to do, man. Yeah. I think there'll be releases in there as well, ideally. <laughs> oh, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, sweet. Well, this has been super fun, man. Um, I have one one more question, though. Yeah, okay. um, is this kind of a, uh, something I've been asking everyone uh, who comes on? I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your um, thoughts on this. 
uh, kind of also talking, it's kind of also relevant to what we've been talking about with burnout and stuff like that. But I think we all make mistakes as we like, you know, do music. And a lot of those are just to do with life. Yeah. Um, but if you had a time machine, what would be one thing that you'd go back and change that you did? Um, oh, This is a tricky one because I, I have like kind of a theory about like, it, like how we were talking about um, uh, everything in your process being a contributing factor in some way um, mm. where like if you try to railroad the way that you do things to an ideal, it can actually kind of constrain the value of certain smaller things that you do that you you aren't even aware of so i Mm. actually find it really hard to answer this because i think there's even the burnout and even the dumb stuff that i've done has somehow led to to the state i'm in now Mm. um yeah honestly i don't know if i would tweak anything Mm. uh there's lots there's been lots of seasons that i've gone through where i've just been like super discouraged and and like down on my music and done things in response to that so if i could do anything i would honestly just go back and encourage myself like i would just go back and be like dude Mm. you're gonna kill it like you're gonna do cool stuff and you're gonna make the music that you really dream about making just like let things be as they are and don't freak out so much yeah. Um, it'll be, it'll be all G like that's, that's, that's what I would love to do is just go back. Like, I would love to be able to take the music that I'm making now and go back to like 16 year old me and be like, this is what you're going to make. And I would be like, Oh, so stoked. that's so cool. Yeah. That's such a good point. I think doubt is like one of the biggest things we all experience in that early on stage. So that's yeah. awesome, man. It's all just going on the journey. You just got to go on the journey and let it happen. Yeah. And that little bit of hope that you've got and that little dream that you've got about your music, it may go through changes and, and iterations and you might think uh, or have new ideas about how that dream translates into a reality. But I think that the important thing is that that little, like, that little spark or that fire that drives you to create, that is a very tangible thing that does bear fruit and does actually come to fruition and can become a real thing if you just allow it you just got to go on that journey and and go through every iteration whatever it looks like exactly man no that's awesome sweet man nah well let's leave it at that i think that's a that's (laughs) that's a good there's a lot in this episode that people can unpack so um yeah man this has been absolutely awesome where um where can people find you online if they haven't uh if they don't follow you and stuff um i mean soundcloud is where i try to post most things um i have a twitch channel as well that's where in in the current state that i'm in that's where i'm most sort of active um i'll just like stream randomly like for three or four hours of just making random stuff so twitch tv uh twitch.tv forward slash it's copycat i-t-s-c-o-p-y-c-a-t-t um every other handle is pretty much it's copycat so my instagram if i'm making anything like official i'll probably make an instagram post and that's just instagram.com forward slash i t s c o p y c a t t not that anyone's typing in the url i'm sure i'll I'll leave it in the um i'll leave it in the show notes for everyone to click on everyone's like waiting for me to read it out like punching in letter (laughs) for letter what i'm saying wait it's like remember when you um when you're a kid and like someone reads out a phone number on the tv or something (laughs) it's like mom get the phone (laughs) (laughs) there was no rewind in those days so if uh, they didn't put it on the screen you're stuffed yeah, it's probably <laughs> true. Actually, that that whole concept's probably lost these days. You just pause it, right? Yeah, yeah you just go anyway. back thirty seconds, or it'll be in the comments. You know, <laughs> yeah. showing my age, showing our ages now, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're relics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, this has been fun. Thanks so yeah. much for coming on, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun, as always. <laughs> Sweet. Man.